the Battle of Chickamauga, the second bloodiest battle of the American Civil War. Three days of intense fighting filled with tales of heroism and tragedy. Perhaps the most remarkable story to come from this historic battle is that of Jacob Miller, a private in the Union Army who was shot right between the eyes and lived. The whole scene is imprinted on my brain as with a steel engraving. Jacob Miller was a private in Company K of the 9th Indiana Volunteer Infantry, part of the 21st Corps, 2nd Brigade, 2nd Division. On September 19, 1863, Miller's division was part of the Union Army Center, standing between the Confederate Army and their objective, Chattanooga, Tennessee. By 7.30 a.m., the first shots rang out, the Union Army failing to prevent the enemy from crossing Chickamauga Creek. By noon, desperate fighting stretched more than a mile across the battlefield. Around this time, the division Jacob Miller was part of advanced, moving into action near Brock's Field. Here, in the thick of the battle, Miller was shot between the eyes by an enemy musket, falling to the field and left for dead. When I came to my senses sometime after, I found I was in the rear of the Confederate line. By the time Jacob Miller regained consciousness, the battle had shifted and his brigade had given up Brock's field. So not to become a prisoner, I made up my mind to make an effort to get around their line and back on my own side. I got up with the help of my gun as a staff, then went back some distance, then started parallel with the line of battle. I suppose I was so covered with blood that those I met did not notice I was a Yank. Miller mustered all of his strength to get himself back to the Union side of the battle. Struggling against unimaginable pain from the open wound in his head. At last, I got to the end of the Confederate line. I struck an old by road and followed it the best I could. By this time, my head was swelled so bad it shut my eyes. Miller could only see by lifting his eyelid with his hand, then would plod along blind for a short time, repeating the practice as needed. Miller eventually made it to Lafayette Road near the Kelly House, then started towards the field hospital. I at length got so badly exhausted, I had to lie down by the side of the road. At last, some bearers came along and put me on their stretcher, carried me to the hospital, and laid me on the ground in a tent. Jacob Miller's wound was examined some time after dark. The surgeons examined my wound and decided it was best not to operate on me and give me more pain, as they said I couldn't live very long. The following morning, the battle lines had changed, the Confederate Army constantly pressing forward. The doctors began preparations to move the wounded to Chattanooga. Miller was deemed too wounded to move and told if he was captured, he could be exchanged after the battle. I made up my mind. As long as I could drag one foot after another, I would not allow myself to be taken prisoner. I got a nurse to fill my canteen with water so I could make an effort in getting near safety as possible. I got out of the tent without being noticed and got behind some wagons that stood near the road till I was safely away. Moving away from the battle was a great struggle for Jacob Miller, still opening his eye with his right hand, then stumbling along blindly. I went away from the boom of cannon and the rattle of musketry. I worked my way along the road as best I could. At one time, I got off to the side of the road and 
bumped my head against a low-hanging limb. The shock toppled me over. The difficulty of walking overcame Miller, requiring him to lay down and rest by the side of the road. I hadn't lain long till the ambulance train began to pass. At last, one of the drivers asked if I was alive and said he would take me in. Then it was all a blank to me. Monday the 21st. I came to myself and found I was in a long building in Chattanooga, Tennessee, lying with hundreds of other wounded on the floor, almost as thick as hogs in a stock car. It's here that Jacob Miller reunited with some men from his company. With their help, he began the journey to Nashville, where the wounded would be treated. By this time, the Battle of Chickamauga had been lost, and the Union Army filled Chattanooga. The wagon trains, artillery, and troops crossing the single pontoon bridge caused a delay for Miller and his companions. We could not get across until almost sundown. When we arrived across and up on the bank, we luckily ran across our company teamster, who we stopped with that night. After we ate, we lay down on a pile of blankets, each fixed under the wagon, and rested pretty well as the teamsters stayed awake to keep our wounds moist with cool water from a nearby spring. Tuesday morning the 22nd, we awoke to the crackling of the campfire that a comrade built to get us a cup of coffee and a bite to eat of hardtack and fat meat. While eating, an orderly rode up and told Miller and the others to head back up the road to have their wounds attended to. After we were fixed up, we drew a few crackers, some sugar, coffee, salt, and a cake of soap and were ordered to get into an army wagon. We got in and started to go over Raccoon or Sand Mountain to Bridgeport, Alabama to take the train to Nashville. After riding in the wagon a while, I found the jolting hurt my head so badly I could not stand it, so had to get out. My comrades got out with me, and we went on foot. I was told it was 60 miles that route to Bridgeport. It took us four days to get there. It must have been an arduous journey for Miller, walking for days with a musket ball lodged in his head. Jacob Miller and the others staggered into Bridgeport just as a train of boxcars were ready to pull out. I got in a car and lay down. I had gained my point so far, and how. As the soldiers term it, with lots of sand, but the sand had run out with me for the time being. After arriving in Nashville, Miller was sent on to Louisville, Kentucky, then to Albany, Indiana, at each stop trying to have his wound tended to. In all the hospitals I was in, I begged the surgeons to operate on my head, but they all refused. I suffered for nine months, then I got a furlough home to Logansport and got doctors Fitch and Coleman to operate on my wound. They took out the musket ball. Miller spent the remaining time of his enlistment in the hospital, then went home to resume his life. Seventeen years after I was wounded, a buckshot dropped out of my wound, and thirty-one years after, two pieces of lead came out. As the final pieces of musket shot fell from Miller's head, he finally found small relief from the persistent pain he had lived with for so long. Sometimes he would find himself in a stupor. At others, delirium would seize him and he would imagine himself again on picket duty. Now that the metal had removed itself from his head, he had one less reminder of his harrowing ordeal. The experience left such an impression that Jacob Miller could seldom be persuaded to speak of it. Fortunately, he recorded it for his family at age 78. 
Some ask how it is I can describe so minutely my getting wounded and getting off the battlefield after so many years. My answer is, I have an everyday reminder of it in my wound and constant pain in the head, never free of it while not asleep. The whole scene is imprinted on my brain as with a steel engraving. The story of Jacob Miller defies belief. The Battle of Chickamauga claimed the lives of more than 34,000 men. Yet Miller survived with a shot to the forehead. He's probably the most remarkable survivor from that battle. Possibly the entire Civil War. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, check out some of my other videos which cover a wide variety of subjects. To keep up with what I'm working on, hit the subscribe button or head over to my website and sign up for my newsletter.